The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that time on he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the third day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, My appointed time draws near. Your house I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The disciples then did as Jesus had ordered and prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed at this, they began to say to him, one after another, Surely it is not I, Lord. He said in reply, He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, as is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, said in reply, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He answered, You have said so. The Gospel of the Lord. Judas is given every opportunity to come clean. Jesus very discreetly lays out to the disciples at table what's going on. He never mentions Judas's name. And they all seem to be wondering who is the betrayer, but Judas himself knows. And in his mercy, Jesus is very, very discreet for the sake of his pastoral care to Judas. And when they're finished, they exit to the garden. In this particular gospel, there's no sudden departure from the table of Judas. And you, when you read it into context, it's almost like he goes off with everybody else. And somehow, while they all go to the garden, he seems to slip out very discreetly. But even in that time, he could have had an opportunity to approach Jesus very discreetly and come clean. But he doesn't. And all the disciples at the table, they say, surely it is not I, Lord. They know that Jesus reads their souls. And they're wondering, does he know something about me that I do not? And so in the form of a question, they say, surely it's not I. You don't know something about me, do you? Is there something I need to know? But they all say, surely it is not I, Lord. With that question, there's a recognition of Jesus' divinity, his lordship. And also the fact that Matthew is implying that because he's Lord, God, he has the power to forgive sins. When Judas asks the question quite separately from everybody else, 
because now he's probably very uncomfortable and Jesus hasn't said anything directly. And he wants to ask the question, but in a different tone. He says, surely it is not I, Rabbi. He calls Jesus Rabbi, not Lord. He doesn't understand what Jesus could do for him. And he's not asking to clear his conscience. He's asking because he's wondering, does he really know? Because he's questioning his lordship. Does he really know what's going on with me? And he wants a direct answer, but it doesn't come. And so, with all this opportunity to repent, Judas goes on his way. It's a testimony for us that there will be ample opportunity given to anyone who has fallen away. You can see in this passage, Jesus and his incessant move to try to reclaim Judas' soul. He just doesn't quit on him. But Judas does. And it's on him. It's a great testimony of hope for us. It's interesting because Jesus, Judas doesn't call Jesus Lord. It seems like he makes his sin bigger than Jesus' power. And that is a lie. No one can do that. No one can make a sin bigger than Jesus' power. But what you can do is walk away from his power to forgive. And this is what Judas does. It's a testimony for all of us, a testimony of hope that Jesus is incessant in sending out his invitation to mercy. However, the act of receiving must be taken up by us. Regina Jenny, let her